Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Veni Sancti Spiritus Reple Tuorum Corda Fidelium et Tui Amoris in Eisingem Acende. Emite Spiritum Tuum et Creabuntur. Et in Amoris Facium Tere. Oremus Eus Pui Corda Fidelium Sancti Spiritus Ultrazioni Locuisti da Nobis Seniorum Spiritu Recte Safare. Et de eu sempre consolatio ni gaudere per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Sede sapientiae. Ora pro nobis. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So today I want to back up a little bit, cover a few things in my notes. I had yesterday that I didn't think were important enough to mention, but I think are either exactly that, either important enough or interesting enough. That I want to go over them again. So, concerning the, uh, the the attempted or at least plotted assassination of Leo X, uh, three cardinals who were involved in that were actually solemnly degraded from the rank of the cardinalate by Leo X. Uh, the uh, the surgeon who was supposed to kill him was put to death in a, in a rather gruesome manner. Uh, but one of those, one, one of the cardinals uh, was, um, his sentence, which was, the you know, author doesn't seem to specify what it was originally, probably death, uh, but then it was commuted to imprisonment for life, and then after that to a mere fine. So uh, even in punishing his would-be assassins, <laughs> He was still uh, rather in indulgent. Um, so, and then just back, backing up to uh, Luther's earliest studies, uh, he studied uh, initially uh, grammar, rhetoric, and poetry at a monastery of the Discalced Carmelites. In fact, interesting note. And apparently he was a, uh, an excellent student there. Um, uh, Hartmann Griesar, whom I mentioned before, said that he had no rival among his fellow students. Uh, eventually, he, he moved on from there uh, and began to study uh, logic, so philosophy. Uh, but then he abandoned that and studied Cicero, Virgil, and Livy. Although he did, uh, in two years, get uh, degrees in philosophy. So he was, whatever the philosophy was he was studying, he impressed his, his, uh, his professors. That we'll see later on what kind of philosophical training he had and that it was not good. Uh, but it was around that time that there was the incident of his friend being struck dead by lightning and he uh, apparently the, the following night entered the monastery. So it was a very sudden decision. Uh, when he went, so in, in the monastery, he subjected himself to very severe discipline, uh, constantly uh, uh, bothered by the thought of his friend who had suddenly died. Uh, to the fact that, in fact, he, to the to the point that he, in fact, fasted and tortured himself, and the uh, and, and Staupitz, whom we mentioned earlier, uh, as being the the superior who wanted to bring all of the monasteries of the the stricter observance of the Augustinian rule under his control, uh, was obliged to get directly involved and restrain Luther's fervor to some extent. Uh, he saw that Luther had a problem with a boundless pride and obstinacy. So he, had, he subjected him to a lot of trials uh, to try to bring that under control, but uh, it seems that in the long run that didn't quite work. Uh, and then he said, again, I mentioned a quote from him yesterday from Luther that might be able to be taken if it were coming from somebody rather more saintly or something edifying, but uh, given the fact that he had this, we see a problem with with this, with this pride and obstinacy that that was probably not spoken out of out of uh, humility, and then he also said later on, uh, sometime sometime after his ordination, that uh, my life is a daily advance toward the pit of hell, for I am every day becoming more and more wicked and wretched. So, not 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 quite so edifying. Although he was eventually called to the chair of philosophy at the University of Wittenberg where he would you know, become very famous later on. And uh, the university, by this, he was called to that position to be in charge of the philosophical studies there by the founder of the university, who was Frederick the Wise, the elector of Saxony. And Frederick had heard and was an admirer of Luther's preaching. Uh, 
and uh, got him to, of course, preach in Wittenberg. And Luther was very popular with the, the youth of, this, of the city. They, always, they all came to hear his lectures. Although older and more sensible men were, we'll say, unfavorably impressed by his proneness to disparage his predecessors, uh, who, of course, were still famous. And then to you know, a little more into the, uh, the controversy that was surrounding the Augustinians, uh, the uh, Staupitz we mentioned uh, was the uh, he was the, he was the provincial of Saxony, the Saxon uh, province of the Augustinian order, and there were some monasteries in that area that wanted to do a more strict observance of the Augustinian rule, and that this was something I do you see uh, fairly often. Of course, Saint Teresa, if, if you were here for the reading of Saint Teresa's biography, or if you've seen that the film on Saint Teresa, then you know that that was a cause of controversy among the, the Carmelites. You know, they, were, they had become, although their rule had become softer and softer, and they, the order had become very wealthy, etc. And then there were some who wanted to go back to the way that everything was originally envisioned by the, the founders, and you know, that caused, we'll say, uh, political problems. So much so that you saw, if you, you know, if you saw the film, then you remember the scene wherein she was placed in charge of one of the unreformed monasteries and they rioted <laughs> to try to prevent her from taking over. Uh, they were barring the gates, wouldn't let her in. Uh, it was quite the scene, if you remember that. So that's this kind of controversy that can erupt when you have uh, essentially politics going on within religious orders. And as, as unedifying as it is to consider that there could be politics among religious orders, uh, you, you see essentially that. And this is another, an, another example of it. And again, Staubitz, his aim was to essentially bring about a, a, a reunification, you we might call it, of all of these monasteries under his control, in, in, at least in the area of, over which he was the provincial. But of course, he met with opposition. Yes? Yes, Father, how do you spell his name? Oh, yes, Staubitz. Uh, so he was, yes, yeah, so they, they have, yes. Uh, so Father, was he in favor of the stricter observance? Yes, he was. Luther was at first. Yeah, until he went to Rome, then he came back. He, came, he was sent there in order to essentially fight for them. But then he came back and switched sides. We'll see that later. Uh, but yeah, he was originally in favor of it. Uh, let's see. But again, he, there was a, a papal bull which essentially gave him the authority to do that, to get, gave Staubitz the authority to take over all these monasteries. And it was after that that Luther was sent when he was 27, 27 years old. Uh, he was sent as a procurator in the case to Rome to try to uh, free these monasteries from the control of Staubitz. And uh, it seems that... Uh, even Hartwell Grisa, who's very thorough, says that whether or not he was successful in his uh, in in his in his efforts to keep them keep them free, it's not it's not entirely clear that there was some compromise that was reached, but the details have somehow escaped from the history books. So whatever it was, I guess it wasn't so important. Uh, but it, it does seem clear that whatever politicking was going on was was brought to was brought to an end. Uh, so the uh, again, that was more. It's more more important to consider it just as the occasion for Luther's traveling to Rome, where he saw it, all kinds of you know, all sorts of things that scandalized him. Of course, what he said has to be taken with with a, with a grain of salt, um, perhaps um, uh, very considerably so, because a lot of what he said about his journey to Rome, he said many years later, when he was, of course, had, had was you know, excommunicated, was, was fully at odds with the church. So some of it maybe has some basis in reality, but a lot of it has to be taken as exaggeration. Uh, that, but that's not to say that there were not truly moral disorders in Rome you know, during the time of Julius II uh, or Alexander VI, and that, that was the era that he went to Rome, specifically when, when Julius II was still pope. But it was still, of course, very much the, the era of Alexander VI, who 
Of course, we see that there are people who dis dispute how bad he was, but certainly had a bad reputation, and that uh, that was uh, no, that's universal. That was that his during his time and even now, he had this bad reputation. Uh, so again, he tells quite a number of disreputable tales about his time spent in Rome, but he was also, of course, anti-Roman. So uh, he was. And he was, he was in the habit of saying that uh, whoever looked about him in Rome would find abominations compared to which those of Sodom were mere child's play. So he was given to saying things like that. Uh, and then he also, uh, another thing he said was that uh, there was somebody who at some point expressed some sort of dismay with the, with the state of things in, in Rome and that this person was uh, dismissed as... Uh, uh, being a, the, the word used was buon bon cristiano, so a good Christian. So, but but the sense of it was being, oh, he's he's a simple natured fellow, and he just he's just um, horrified by this because he's a little bit simple. And that again, that's that's what Luther says that he that somebody called such a person that again, not that Luther has any room to be uh, you know, pointing fingers at moral disorders given his later life, but that's what he he he's, he's repeated he repeats these things. Uh, he, he also asserts that there was a, a statement made in his presence that many priests were in the habit of repeating jokes at Mass in the place of the words of consecration. Now, a little hard to believe that, that things would be quite that bad, but it just gives you an idea of the, the sort of things that he was willing to say later on. And he, he relates that he even questioned whether the bishops and priests at Rome, the prelates of the Curia, and even the Pope had any Christian belief left. You know, whether whether that would be justified in any one case or another is really sort of a sigh. It's just that you know, there seems to be a lot of exaggeration in some of these things he was saying. Uh, and then, in fact, one of his biographers says, it is questionable how much weight is due to statements which, in part, date from the later years of his life when he was so completely altered. And then there was an, another incident. He went to the, the Santa Scala at the Lateran, which is a... It means the holy ladder, a place where if you climb on your knees, you get a, a plenary indulgence. Uh, he saw people doing this, you know, climbing it on these, these steps on their knees, and he preferred not to do that. So he was already turning away from acts of piety at that point. And you see that in you know, all of his ideas, attacking good works, attacking indulgences, all his, all his various ideas, they obviously didn't come to him overnight. They, they developed over time. And there was this... This is held up, of course, he, uh, there's a quote from, from actually his son, and he did have a son later on, at least one, who in 1582 said that on this occasion he quoted the verse, the just man liveth by faith. But of course, there's a strong possibility that this was um, added, on to the, uh, added on to a true story from earlier on in order to make it look like he had already, you know, had already developed his, his, uh, his heresy at that point, his, his doctrine, as he would have called it. But Luther himself declares that he only you know, discovered his gospel, as it were, after he had taken his doctor's degree, which was later on. So perhaps there's some embellishment of these stories, but there probably was something there already, that he was already turning away from, from good works. Uh, but it, it is interesting to note that when he visited Rome, his conviction of the authority of the Holy See was not shaken at that point. And he may have been horrified by his moral disorders, but at that point, uh, he was still, uh, he, he still fully admitted the authority of the papacy. And all the scandals he had seen, you know, whether the accounts of them given afterwards were exaggerated or not, had not, you know, had not uh, convinced him of any heresy in that regard. And even as late as 1516, he was still teaching in accordance with the doctrine of the church and the power of the papacy. So only a year before everything really blew up. He was still teaching uh, the, Catholic, the Catholic faith on that point. And he even said that uh, if Christ had not entrusted all power to one man, the church would not have been perfect because there would have been no order, and each one would have been able to say he was led by the Holy Ghost. This is what the heretics did, each one setting up his own principle. And in this way, as many churches arose as there were heads, Christ therefore wills in order that all may be assembled in one unity, that his power be exercised by one man to whom he commits it. He has, however, made this power so strong 
that he loses all uh, let's see, the power, loses all the powers of hell without injury against it. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As though he said, they will fight against it, but never overcome it. So that in this way, it is made manifest that this power is in reality from God and not from man. Or ever, uh, wherefore, whoever breaks away from this unity and, pow and order of the power, let him not boast of great enlightenment and wonderful works, as our Picards and other heretics do, for much better is obedience than the victims of fools who know not what evil they do. So, he's convicted as a heretic by his own words from, you know, from earlier on, but convicted as a heretic by his own words. Uh, so, uh, but with, so, with regard to uh, his ideas with regard to the church's means of grace, the mass indulgences and, and prayers, at the time of his return to Germany from Rome, had also uh, well, had had undergone uh, sorry had not gone, undergone any theoretical change. But again, we see that he was already in practice moving away from good works to some degree, as that uh, incident in Rome uh, illustrates. His you might say his practical observance of the church law had suffered considerably. Uh, but he does say at the same time, you know, he said it as a joke later on that at Rome he had been so zealous in gaining indulgences that he wished his parents were already dead so that he might apply to their souls the great indulgences which could be obtained there. So probably an exaggeration. Or even he said it as a joke, so an exaggeration. But uh, at least in theory, he still held to the church's teachings on indulgences. He attacked it later on when it became convenient. Uh, he said also, uh, he said that he celebrated Mass, of course, when he was in Rome. Uh, he said he, he celebrated it uh, so, so piously and slowly that three or even six Italian priests or monks had finished all their Masses in succession before he had come to the end of one. And that in Rome, Mass was said so rapidly that ten, one after another, occupied only one hour. And that he himself had been urged on with the cry, hurry up, brother, hurry up. So... Almost definitely exaggerations. There's no way that that's true, as he says it. But it's, it, he, what he's doing is he's emphasizing his own, uh, the precipitation of the priest that he saw in Rome as compared to his own more slower, and perhaps at the time more reverent habits of when he said Mass. And there may be, and that may be true that he was better about saying Mass at the time than a lot of these other priests that he saw. That's, that's possible. Uh, and apparently the only thing that he actually liked about uh, his, his stay in, in Rome, or in, so what he saw in Italy in general, uh, was the, the charity and benevolence that he saw in some hospitals, particularly in Florence. And uh, he said also the sobriety of the people at Rome, care, careful carrying out of ecclesiastical business. Although, of course, he did see the, uh, the, moral, the general moral laxity that was taking over the country. And that, of course, because, of course, the, the rich and opulent uh, towns, higher, higher classes, were all infected with, with humanism to a degree, which we see, of course, as just follow nature in the worst sense possible. And, of course, and even these, the, these authors say that uh, the traveling was dangerous, that, that the, the, the inns, the, essentially the, the equivalent of the hotels of the time, were uh, full of uh, the worst moral dangers. And that uh, in those years, the... Uh, uh, the disease syphilis was infected, uh, infected a wide area of the country, uh, having been introduced by troops who came in to southern Italy. So, indicating some of the moral disorders that they were just in general at the time. And so Luther returned to Germany in February 1511, uh, but he was somewhat transformed by his experiences. Uh, he said, after his apostasy, but he said that I, like a fool, carried onions to Italy and brought garlic, meaning worse, worse stuff, back with me. So essentially, he was, he was already going downhill when he went there, and he blames it on, essentially on, on precipitating that process. Uh, and then also after he returned, he immediately changed his standpoint regard, regarding the observance, meaning the, the stricter observance of the Augustinian rule that he had originally been in favor of and had been sent to Rome, in fact, to champion. Uh, he veered around unexpectedly and became its opponent, uh, so that uh, he, was, he, he was said to have deserted to Staupitz. 
uh, Luther was uh, seen, uh, in fact, passionately uh, assailing the, the Observantines, as they were called, uh, in, so in contrast to the fact that he was very much in favor of them before. And then he returned to the Observantine Monastery of Erfurt, where he had been before, and then went to Wittenberg, uh, where he was to, uh, he worked on his degree of Doctor of Divinity, so he was working on his doctorate, and then also became a professor there. Uh, and there's also, in, this author says that it's it, doubtless that Staupitz's influence, uh, uh, it was under his influence that the fulfillment of those hopes which he had formerly cherished now arose on the horizon of his mind. So there may have been interest of personal gain in his switching from being uh, an, uh, an observantine to, to the other side, that he wanted to curry favor with Staupitz so that he would help his academic advancement. Uh, because and the author continues uh, on by saying that uh, to continue to withstand Staupitz in the matter of the observance could prove but a hindrance to his advance. So it may or may have, it may have just been a matter of personal gain that he switched on that. So, uh, it was in the spring of 1511 that Luther uh, began, first began qualifying again, doing his work towards his in Wittenberg, his uh, work towards his degree of doctor uh, in divinity. And he passed all the tests and everything uh, and received his theological degree in October 1512, 15, 15, in fact, October 1st. So this is today's the anniversary of that. It's not something, don't celebrate that. <laughs> uh, at once, he, uh, he immediately commenced his lectures on sacred scripture, uh, his first course being the Psalms. So. Um, not, not, as, not as good as the course you're taking now, I'll tell you that. Uh, and, uh, but actually his, his lectures were, had, had a similar purpose, um, a similar immediate purpose, and that was to get the, the Augustinians to whom he was lecturing to uh, prepare them to, uh, so they could understand better what they were singing in choir. And uh, he displayed in, in even his earliest lectures uh, his, his rhetorical style. The authors call his, his fancy and eloquence and his ability to, uh, quote, uh, to find quotations in scripture, uh, but also his extraordinary subjectivity and the vehemence of his passion, which is something out of place when you're talking about sacred scripture. Uh, but of course, at, at the time, there, there wasn't any, uh, the, the university was Catholic. He hadn't, he hadn't made it into a hive of heresy at that point. But it, it was, the scholarship was infected with humanism. Uh, what this author calls Italian naturalism, and that did have its effect on Luther. Uh, and of course, you know, we saw earlier the just to what extent uh, humanism brought back paganism, and so that that had its effects on him. Uh, let's see. And then also we can, we can see here uh, some earlier on the uh, Luther's, uh, let's see, his relations, his dealings with, uh, with Erasmus, and we'll see later on. But at, the same, at, at that point, he was on, basically on good terms with him. He called him, in a letter he said, our Erasmus. And it doesn't mention to whom he was writing, but it shows he was favorably, dis favorably disposed towards him. They, they had a split later on. And even then... Uh, he says that his liking for this fellow is getting weaker. Uh, but it was not to the attitude of Erasmus to the church in general from which, because of which Luther separated from him. They, I guess they decided to go, go their separate ways and form different sects. Yes? Right, well, how do you spell uh, Erasmus? So, you know, right now we're sort of introducing things. We're still setting, the, we're laying the groundwork for Luther's later career. It's like, uh, it's like putting in place all the sticks of dynamite which are going to explode in the, in the fairly near future. That's what we're doing right now. We're putting in the dynamite. Or we're looking at the holes that are being drilled. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, one, one of the effects of humanism on... Uh, on, well, on both of them, was that it uh, very much strengthened the, uh, their, uh, their adherence to a certain individualism, which of course makes sense if you're talking about private inspiration, and personal interpretation, etc. Uh, or, or personal, personal inspiration, private interpretation. Uh, 
it makes sense that you would, uh, if you'd heard a lot about individualism from humanism, that you would start applying that to your, you know, to your own particular brand of heresy. And uh, we mentioned some time ago that the, the art of printing was uh, becoming widely available at this point. So, of course, books began to go everywhere, made it that much easier for heresy to spread. Uh, so, with, with those greater facilities for, the, for say, increase uh, in the, of the means of study and criticism, uh, there were, uh, we went to, of course, went to all branches of learning. The, it made it possible for the results to be as devastating as they were. And also, at, at this, around this time, various states, uh, various, various nations were trying to free themselves from the tutelage of the church. So again, we're laying, so laying the groundwork here. We're looking at the fact that Luther didn't uh, invent all of, the, uh, all, of the, all the problems which he took advantage. In other words, there was already uh, humanism, individualism. Uh, there was, um, a, 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 I'd say, a spirit of rebellion against the church that these nations were trying to free themselves from. And we'll see, they, they had mostly material motives for it. Like uh, there was, a, we'll see it, but there was a certain taxation that the church made of the of the of the lands that it held, and there were other. Uh, there were, I guess, it legitimated itself for the church to do that, but these states were finding it more burdensome, and uh, there were also there were there were abuses that were going on, and we'll see those. Uh, but it's, especially, of course, in Germany, which is uh, Luther's home turf. Uh, the landed great the landed proprietors and princes were uh, very much unified in the intent of ridding themselves from what they considered to be oppression, and of course securing for themselves an increase of their own power. As a result, the church had of course a huge amount of territory. The church was very wealthy around this time, had very large amounts of territory in these various nations. So by th essentially by throwing off any sort of burdens that the church put on them, they could take all those riches, all that territory for themselves. Which is, of course, we'll see it later on, but that was a, one of the motives of Henry VIII. In fact, it, there was a certain point where he put uh, St. Thomas of Becket on trial, who had been dead for centuries, <laughs> but he put him on trial. Uh, and then said, oh, he didn't show up for his trial, so therefore we can confiscate everything the monasteries have. Yeah, ridiculous, but... Clearly, that's what he was after, was stealing the riches of the church, essentially. So everywhere in these restraints, whatever restraints the church had put on these states, and in any way, it was all, it was all sort of coming apart. Uh, of course, at the expense of the, the, the order that uh, had been established in the Middle Ages, as well as at the expense of the church's religious authority. So if they start to throw off all of the, they're trying to get rid of these... these uh, these, these uh, material burdens that, that they don't like that the church is putting on them, uh, very, it's very much in their interest to throw off the church's religious authority, obviously. Uh, and of course, it would have been better, the church would have been better able to deal with these, with these problems if there had been less weakness and abuse among the clergy. Uh, of course, the, the faith was still being preached, the, the sacraments were still available, in, in a sense, of course, the soul of the church was unchanged, as, of course, it, it will always be unchanged. So in that sense, they were better off then than we are now, <laughs> because they had at least a functioning hierarchy that was teaching their faith. They didn't have a, um, a worldwide network of heretics who were trying to impose a, a counterfeit religion. <laughs> uh, so in that sense, it was better, even if there were abuses. Uh, there were, you've seen, uh, lamentable imperfections, uh, disruptive forces were able to come into play with fatal results as an effect of that. And there were complaints of you know, devout men who actually had a true zeal for souls, who, um, who denounced uh, the decline of religious life, the corruption of the clergy, uh, and these, these complaints were well-founded. Of course, when you have, any, when you have a, a huge organization that's very wealthy, they're going to have the bad people come in. Um, so. Now, perhaps that's one of the uh, one of the purposes of the, of the current problems that we that we're suffering now is to, in a sense, to reduce. I mean, I'm not saying that I, I know, of course, the, all the designs of divine providence, but 
I mean, for one thing, <laughs> nobody's entering the priesthood anymore for motives of greed. <laughs> That's for sure. You know, you know nobody becomes a, preach, a priest in order to become rich anymore. Or is that the, at this time, that was a serious consideration that you could get as many. And we'll see this. One of the one of the abuses that was going on was this this practice of people acquiring benefices that they never saw. People becoming abbots of abbeys that they never visited, but they were still receiving all the revenue from those places. That was, a, that was an abuse. That was a true abuse that was going on. Uh, but again, when you have a huge organization, uh, the church is doing very well, uh, materially, very, it's very wealthy, then you're going to get people who are going to want to make an easy living that way. Uh, like you see, uh, like, uh, you know, centuries earlier, but the way that St. Thomas Aquinas' family wanted him to become an abbot because that was a prestigious position. So as an example, that's what happens when the church is doing very well materially. Uh, so, uh, so what the, the monk of Wittenberg, and this author calls Martin Luther, calls Luther that, the monk of Wittenberg, uh, the, what he was about to unleash on the world with his, uh, his call for reform, as it was perceived as, uh, had already been uh, urged by... Uh, well, I should say the reforms that he was urging were already had already been called for to a, to a great extent. Uh, it's just, of course, he, he called for them with the, with the intention of bringing about a, a general revolution. Uh, so it's not like nobody had thought of dealing with the problems that, that he brought up. Uh, there, were, there were, of course, strict uh, and experienced men who were, um, again, with a true zeal for souls, who wanted to bring about you know, a reform of the morals, for example, of, of various abuses that were going on. They wanted to fix those things. But, uh, of course, L Luther had other means in mind. And again, the, something also to keep in mind is that, uh, generally speaking, weaknesses, disorders, things like that, of ge evils generally, are much more uh, apparent. Uh, they, they catch the attention much more than anything good which is going on. Because uh, I mean, don't forget, when you have uh, also an organization this big in, in, the, in the church like this, you're going to have a lot of people who are going to be doing great good. But you know, when you think about the early 16th century, you think of Martin Luther and all the problems he caused, and not any of the you know, anything good which was going on. Uh, and there's uh, and there's an author who says that uh, he says take ne take heed never to pass a universal judgment when speaking only of many otherwise you will never or hardly ever escape uh, passing an unjust one. And this coming from an author who's apparently uh, was unsparing in lashing the weaknesses of the clergy of his day. So some, something to keep in mind there. Uh, let's see. Okay, so. Uh, disorders in Germany had, did have it to be admitted too, too powerful as a stronghold in the higher ranks of ecclesiastical authority. The filling of church offices, uh, uh, worldly, in the filling of church offices, uh, worldly influence was, was paramount. That was a tremendous concern. Uh, the people wanted that. Uh, if, if, you were, if you knew all the right people, you would, uh, you would get the positions. And the moral disorders, of course, that's to be laid at, at the feet to, to a great extent of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the superiors of these people who were evidently either lazy or incompetent, but whatever the case, uh, they did not do their job in cleaning up these things. And there were, of course, uh, some abuses in the system of indulgences, pilgrimages, etc., uh, even even things uh, connected to the veneration of the saints, there were excesses in those things. Uh, it's, that, that has to be admitted. And we'll see later on the, you know, when Luther decided to start attacking indulgences, uh, started attacking the sale of indulgences. Now, we'll, we'll see all that later, but what the church was doing was in fact legitimate, even if those who were doing it, those who were, who were, who were propagating it, were doing it in an imprudent or uh, excessively commercial manner. Uh, but it's just more, mostly the, the fact that, that money was involved that, that Luther latched onto. So also, in, even, but even the lower clergy, where of course we, we just dealt with the, the higher clergy uh, seeking you know, positions in the church as, as uh, positions of worldly influence, 
even the lower clergy were not in keeping with the dignity of their state. Uh, we've seen that in you know, previous uh, time, um, eras of church history. There was you know, a lot of immorality. There was uh, widespread concubinage among the clergy. And even to the, to the point that uh, when they weren't even ashamed of it, that uh, there, were, there were occasions at which the popes would try to reform these things, say, you, you, you can't do that. You're going to function as a, as a cleric. You can't do that. And they say, well, well we, we need our wives to help us you know, take care of things. They would seriously argue that. And they, they, were, they were angry that the pope was trying to discipline them in these things. So yeah, that, that wasn't talking about this period, but you know, it just goes to show that when we hear about corruption in the higher clergy, it doesn't mean that everybody, of course, on the ground level is necessarily a saint either. Uh, and uh, of course, in, in, in contrast to the, the <coughs> higher clergy who sometimes sought out these positions uh, as, as means of uh, power or wealth, the lower clergy, in, in many cases, suffered from poverty and, uh, and started, started taking up means of livelihood that were not in, in, uh, in accordance with the, the clerical state. And so and that's a problem. And they were, you know, as a result, they were ready to join any movement which promised to promote its aims. So any, 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 anything like Luther said that since we need to take the wealth from, from the ecclesiastical institutions and redistribute it, they're going to be in favor of that. So we just see how the, uh, just, uh, to what extent this powder keg is ready to explode. And there was even uh, concubinage among the higher clergy. Uh, that, of course, was naturally going to repel people. And there were, uh, there were uh, clerics who were furnished with briefs from the papal court that, and we mentioned this earlier, that seized upon the, the best benefices and gave an infectious example of greed. And their action helped to add fuel to the prejudice and hatred already existing for the, for the curia, for the, the administrative congregations in Rome. And I guess that has to do with, uh, probably, probably, probably come across it later on in these notes, but again, that has to do with you know, potentially people going around and collecting as many benefices as possible without any intention of actually taking care of those things. And also just a benefice, and for anybody who's not clear on that, is uh, essentially a post that a cleric takes up and uh, has a, there's a certain income connected with it. But the, the abuse was the fact that they would go around collecting all these revenues without doing anything actually. They may, may have been theoretically in charge of that place. So for example, an abbot may have been theoretically in charge of this or that monastery, but he never saw it because he was just uh, you know, essentially a, a courtesan living in, living in, in Rome and in no, never visited these monasteries of which he was supposedly the abbot. And again, of course, all of these, all these abuses, you know, moral uh, laxity and uh, other, uh, other abuses, uh, were going to bring about this pleasure in laymen. Uh, that uh, seeing that these, that these influential posts in the church were being filled by people who were, in one way or another, not suited for them. Uh, and that those, again, they were, that there were people who were theoretically assigned to them, but instead of, of course, they never administered them, other people came in who were not, also not up to the task of administering these benefices. Uh, and then also some of the, the wealthier churches and monasteries were appropriated by, by use for princes and nobility so that they essentially became like, uh, almost like retirement homes for, for these uh, officials. And that was also something that uh, was had to be dealt with, as I, as I recall, that uh, something that St. Teresa dealt with in reforming the, the Carmelites is that it, uh, the, the way one of the one of the one of the authors put it was that there, were, there was a problem of of these of convents becoming more like uh, essentially retirement homes of ladies who, for one reason or another, could never get married. So they decided, well, I'm, I'm wealthy. I'll go into join one of these wealthy monasteries. So it became almost like social gatherings. <laughs> For, for ladies who couldn't get married for one reason or another. And that was a problem. <laughs> there were too many people doing that. Uh, and then also the agreement brings to mind what the family of St. Thomas Aquinas wanted for him, uh, but it was most likely it was much more prevalent by this time, and that is that the, also these wealthier monasteries uh, 
saw it as a way to essentially these wealthy families saw these wealthy monasteries as a way for the younger members of the family for whom there was not perhaps not as much wealth or territory owned by the family to give them a decent share they thought okay well, if we, we put him in a monastery he'll become the abbot he'll be influential and rich that way and much like the family of saint thomas had in mind for him so it became almost like uh, you know, if you were the youngest in a, in a large wealthy family in a large noble family that you would that, that, that's what, that was just what you were going to do you were going to enter a, a monastery and become the abbot it was like part of the social code of the time. Or something. And of course, we'll see in, in, in even in later centuries, practices like that continued uh, to the point that it was even during the French Revolution that there was uh, the, the famous Bishop Talleyrand. Has anybody heard of him? Probably quite a bit. If you've heard of him, you never forget it. Uh, but he said he was, he was an example of that, of a, a younger member of a family who had essentially been, been forced into the priesthood. And he said things to the effect that uh, they maybe become a priest, and now they're going to regret it. Uh, he said. He said that later on, uh, when he was involved in setting up the schismatic church in France, because he did that. He, he's more famous for being a diplomat than for being a bishop, because he, after he consecrated bishops for the constitutional church in France, essentially the clergy who went along with the revolution and they formed their own schismatic church. He consecrated bishops for them, and then stopped functioning as a cleric and just just became a, took up a diplomatic career. And then was, well, it has to be admitted though, he was incredibly good at always being on the winning side in all these things. Uh, but Napoleon hated him. Of course, we're getting centuries ahead of ourselves here, but we'll get there eventually. That'll be, most likely that'll be next year. We'll cover all of that. But it just goes to show the, the evil effects of forcing people into the priesthood who don't have vocations. Uh, of course, any efforts that were made to reform monasteries that had become lax like this uh, were frequently stifled by worldly influences, like exactly what we're talking about. That these, these nobles didn't like to have a wrench thrown in their system, so they didn't want to have these monasteries turned into well, more like monasteries rather than uh, social institutions or places for their younger sons to become rich and powerful. Uh, and you're rich, and they may have taken the, the vow of poverty, but rich in the sense of being in control of a monastery that had a lot of property. Uh, so they really, it has to be admitted that the disintegration of the ecclesiastical order was constantly on the increase. And then many German princes arrogated to themselves still further privileges and more and more interference in the church. There had to uh, uh, grown up in many districts, uh, a system of secular influence in the church, yet long before the, the revolts in the 16th century took place. Um, but of course, when that did take place, it was just a matter of bringing to uh, a termination or, or, or advancing along the process that was already in motion, that these princes then made the church completely subject to themselves. Which is interesting to note is that monarchical, uh, essentially absolutism, uh, the system in which the, the monarch has total power in his territory is a result of Protestantism, not, not the Catholic faith, because it was, uh, Luther came up with, he was the first one to say that, uh, cuius regio ilius religio, in other words, whose region it is, so also it is his religion. In other words, that the, the prince, because there were you know, local, a lot of local princes at the time, that whatever religion the ruler of the country had, of the, of the state, whatever it was, he also determined the religion of that area. So he was essentially not only the civil ruler, but also the religious ruler. And again, with that, with that putting into place that system, that means that the monarch has total control. Whereas among, among Catholics, obviously the, 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 the monarch, even in, in times, obviously in, in countries that have monarchs, uh, there was de definitely a limitation. They couldn't interfere in, in, in the affairs of the church. They tried to, they did it a lot. But there was the church always was there was always a, there was a battle going on. Whenever that happened, there was most of the time there was a conflict. Uh, some waged more or less successfully by the church, depending on how strong the pope was at the time, how uh, how much or how little the pope was willing to yield to that. Uh, but in these areas where essentially the the church the property of the church had been confiscated and her influence had gone away, uh, there was nothing to put in the power of the monarch to check. So. Absolutism is a result of Protestantism. Um, 
and of course, the, the state of the clergy at the time uh, tested, you know, even those who were essentially remaining Catholic, their fidelity was uh, put to a severe test when they saw all these disorders, when they saw the, how scandalous the clergy tended to be. Uh, but again, it's not to say that in, even in the civil order that there were, that there, that there were no problems. Uh, in fact, the, the, our author says that uh, the disorders in matters ecclesiastical, so when ecclesiastical concerns in Germany would not have brought about the sad consequences they did had they not been accompanied, accompanied by a great number of social evils, uh, especially the intense um, uh, miscontent of the lower classes with their position and a, jeal a hostile jealousy of the laity against the privileges and possessions of the clergy. So they were, the, the, even, even the, the, the peasants were ready for a revolution. Uh, they were not happy with the state of affairs. Uh, in fact, in many localities, the peasants were in arms against their princes and masters for the improvement of their conditions. And this also is a general rule you've seen throughout history that the, the many times revolutions has come about because you know, religious fail, fail to do exactly this to improve things in advance. That if they had, it may well be that a revolution could have been prevented. Like uh, the, the Russian Revolution the, the, in 1917, uh, there was an earlier revolution uh, over a decade earlier uh, that was re really had many of the same motives. The, the, the peasants were not happy with their, their state of affairs. And so they, they were given some concessions, like there was a, a Duma was founded in Russia, essentially a parliament. It didn't make much of a difference. The, the Tsar was still in control. But you know, the, the point is that had those things been rectified, then the revolution could have been uh, forestalled. Like we see here, if there had been decisive action taken to reform the morals of the clergy, to rectify abuses, if the, um, if say the lower clergy had had the support that they needed, so they didn't have to go about and find other other occupations that were not 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 in, not in accordance with the clerical state. Uh, if these uh, if these if these princes had been put in check, then. And, and the and the uh, and the lot of the peasants improved. Then you would have removed all of the motives. Martin Luther would have had nothing to work with. He may have, you know, he may have still developed his crazy heretical ideas because of his own you know, personal problems, uh, whatever spiritual, mental, whatever they may have been. But he wouldn't have had. Uh, essentially, the dynamite wouldn't have been there. <laughs> there wouldn't have been. Uh, there would have been no, uh, no no plunger for him to push and, and detonate. So it was, of course, uh, the spirit of unrest and miscontent, which, uh, of which the, the coming of the uh, intellectual and religious uh, revolution, rebellion, uh, revolt, uh, was to avail itself of all those things. And also, just talking about the, the Russian Revolution, it's called the October Revolution. Just for the record, it happened in November. <laughs> the reason it's called the October Revolution is because of the difference of calendars. So it happened in November. So if anybody asks you what month it happened in, uh, it is actually November. Uh, so. And then, of course, there was, uh, you know, as a result of Renaissance and humanism, there was a, an, a, a fact, this author says, a complete religious indifference that had taken root among the most highly cultured. Uh, again, the... Uh, there was a system. It's true that the church uh, had to raise raise taxes from her territories. Uh, but this was highly unpopular in various nations. And again, we'd have to look at it more closely to look see what exactly the resources of these nations were and what what kind of you know, taxes the church was imposing. But these these various nations complained of these taxes uh, as they became more and more firmly established. But of course, you may remember that the uh, the that this started and this arrangement started when the popes were in Avignon for a long time. That there, of course, when you have the, 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 the pope living in France, uh, you know, big court and everything, that's expensive to maintain. <laughs> so we started, we started taking money from the, from, from the, from the French state, from the, from the, uh, uh, from the, from the kingdom of France and thereby making themselves unpopular. I remember that it was on at least one occasion that I can recall that one of the uh, there was during the Great Western Schism that one of the anti popes was ousted by the French king because he was becoming too expensive. 
<laughs> too expensive. But there might be some advantages to having you know, your a pope who's in in your pocket, or at least uh, appears to be. But uh, at the same time, it becomes expensive. All right. <laughs> Amen.